Okay, so, let's see. As I mentioned, some of the stuff that we'll talk in the session, um, we'll talk about in the session were previously discussed in an unrecorded um, discussion from a couple weeks ago. I'll try and summarize as best as I could. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll actually kind of summarize here. I mean, why not? We talked about the concept of if we're, we're, we're talking about God. And is God wicked or immoral for being able and having the power to do for, to stop something bad from happening but not doing it because that's what people say right so if god either god is isn't powerful and he can't stop it or he is powerful and he's just evil and he doesn't care to stop the bad things from happening right so we looked at that but but we asked in more of a personal way of okay so should you actually if it was in your power to do to, to do good and to stop something bad from happening should you always do it and basically the discussion, and I'll try and record something that summarizes our discussion, but basically we decided, no, it's not always best to do what's good, even if it is in your power to do the good thing. Because if you're, you know, it, well, I, I, I don't really want to get into the conversation too much, but that was basically where the discussion left off at, and I totally agree with it. Just because it is in God's power to prevent something bad from happening doesn't mean you necessarily should, especially in a lot of different situations, and that doesn't make him evil or bad. Nor does God allowing something uncomfortable or painful happening to us make him, you know, uncaring or bad. So I will try to get that re-recorded, we recorded, and uploaded. Um, hopefully this week. Um, it's not going to be as good because I really had a lot of interaction between Eli and Isaiah, so it's not going to be as good. But you know, I'll, I'll try to get the main points. So uh, we, for the past couple, uh, couple lessons and whatnot, we were talking about Job quite a few times. And so I just want to look at Job and God and kind of answer a question that I began to ask a couple different times, and I, and I kind of was letting it marinate for a little bit, but then everybody got sick and we had to cancel, so now it might be out of everybody's minds anyways. In Job, let's kind of summarize things up here, okay? God, Satan comes before, before God, and God brings up Job to Satan. Satan doesn't bring up Job. God does. And it's one of those situations where it's like, leave me out of this, God. And that's kind of what happens, too. So God brings him up, and then Satan's all like, you know, he only worships you because he doesn't have a reason not to worship you. And so then God allows Satan to punish Job. So it sounds like maybe, so was God fooled into bringing up Job? Or maybe, okay, so uh, God knew that, knew that Satan was going to do it, so he brought up Job just so that he could have an opportunity to punish Job for no reason. So, I mean, if you were a if you were not a skeptical, but, uh, um, well, I'll just say a skeptic, uh, uh, a critical person of God. Um, and for that question, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, from the from those series of events, it, it begs the question, so why did God do that? Why did God bring up Job when Satan didn't bring him up? And then why did he um, did he allow Satan to do something to Job when Job hadn't done anything to deserve it? So let's let's look at something before we this is going to be this is going to kind of be a question that's not as not as simple to answer as it might first appear. First off, there's two different kinds of things. There's some things that God allows and some things that God causes, right? So something that God allows is something that isn't necessarily according to his word, his will. It's not something that he necessarily desires to do, but he will allow it to happen, right? So, like, this is a good example. This is Adam and Eve in the garden, right? He obviously didn't want them to sin, and yet he still allowed it to happen. He didn't cause them to sin, but he did allow it to happen. So this kind of is, is what people refer, refer to as God's permissive will. But then there's um, the things that God causes now the the problem is is that makes people think okay so if what he allows is his permissive will this must be his um what, his desired will his, his desired outcome but that's not always true either sometimes god causes something that he didn't really desire I'll, you might say what does that mean well uh in the books of, of first and second kings and first and second chronicles and the prophets we see israel falling away from god and disobeying and rebelling and all this different stuff right and then we see god causing punishment on them does that mean that god desired to punish he was just he was just waiting 
No. In fact, he says, I don't get joy from punishing wicked people. And so we see that God causing something doesn't mean that that's what he wanted to happen. He wanted Israel to repent. He wanted Israel to trust in him. They didn't. But that takes us to the, to the concept of Job and why God brought up Job to Satan and allowed Satan to do this thing when Job had done nothing wrong. Why do you do that? Well, God allowed Satan to do it, but if you read Job, he also kind of caused it in a way. He didn't specifically go out and do bad things to Job himself. However, he was the person who brought up Job to Satan. He was the person who allowed Satan to go and do these things to Job. So he, he was definitely, you could say that he caused it in a way. In a way. Um, obviously, we don't see in the Bible God just being mean to people for no reason. You know what I mean? Like, if you read the pagan myths, especially other accounts of the flood, you see the gods are like, God, those people are so loud. Let's drown them. For no reason. I mean, just, they're kind of irritating. You know, the, or you'll see the different gods do different things that, that have no real basis in reason. Just, eh, why not? In fact, in a lot of the Greek myths, for instance, uh, you see the gods are more, I don't want to say manipulative, but if the boot fits. You know, maybe, maybe we should settle on that word, manipulative. But the thing is, God isn't intimidated. So Satan is doing his, his thing, and God wasn't intimidated into, into like, oh, well, I can't back down now. I brought up Satan, I brought up, I brought up Job, and now that Satan wants to go t test him, I, I can't back down now. See, that's how we do things. We do things, even when we get angry, right? We get angry, and we try to, we try to prove our points, and we try to be right, because those are the things that we're concerned about. But God, God doesn't have pissing contests, right? Like, he, he's completely secure about who he is. He's God. He doesn't need to prove it. He doesn't need to, you know, like, go around and, you know, puff his chest out like some kind of a rooster. He, he, he doesn't have to do that kind of stuff. He's, he's secure in, his, in, in, in himself. Like, he, he's not insecure like us. He doesn't, he might experience similar emotions to us, but very, very rarely do we ever have any emotions that are from the same cause as God. So God, for instance, will get angry because of people living in sin, right? But we get angry because people just piss us off. You know what I mean? Like, he still loves them. He just hates, you know, the sin. It's so against his character. It's like, it's, it's like the, when you try to push those magnets together that are pushing each other and pushing uh, themselves away. So God allowing something means he hasn't intervened yet. And I want you to, I want you to remember this in different situations in your life. You might be going through, through something and saying, hey, why isn't God, you know, resolving this? Why isn't God speaking to me in this? Here's the thing. Just because God hasn't intervened does, doesn't mean he won't intervene. It just means he hasn't intervened yet. God causing it means that he is, he's behind it. So here's the thing, different, different pain and whatnot that you go through in life. You can look at it as God allowed this or God caused it. And oftentimes you won't know for sure, but it's best to just come to peace with it and realize that this is a situation and God can give you peace through the situation. What we do is we try and argue with God. Why did you let this happen? Or we try and, and prove our innocence, or we try to get it to stop happening, or to prevent it from going any further, or some way of reversing time. But with God, it's it's more like this. Just rest in God and seek Him through the process, and He will grow you. And even though you're going through this uncomfortable situation, God will be there with you in it. And honestly, that's a lot more important, because we can have all the answers and not be happy. Or we can be happy. And know that you aren't going to have all the answers. Just the way it is, you know. Um, okay, so God does things in his time frame, and he also does it in his way. Just because he hasn't answered yet doesn't mean he isn't going to. There, You have to come to the point of realizing that now is not final. You know, if you're going through something, oh, oh you know, God, you know, this has happened for years and God never gave me a solution. Well, just keep seeking God. And, and here's the thing. Even if even if God never gives you the answer on that, you'll be better off having sought, uh, sought him, socked him, seeked him, having sought him. 
Um, okay, so in Jeremiah and Isaiah, for instance, the two two really big prophets um, in the Bible. The real, I mean, big. I mean, long. The, the books they wrote were long. I don't mean like they were more important than like Obadiah, but I mean they had longer books. So these are two really big prophets here, Jeremiah and Isaiah, and they both mentioned about how God caused the punishment on Israel for sin. That wasn't something that God allowed. It's something he directly caused. There's, a, there's this idea that God doesn't ever cause anything unpleasant, and that's just completely not true. Like, for instance, so I heard one person saying, and they said, oh, well, COVID, we know that that isn't from God. And it's like, how do we know it's not from God? Okay, did God tell us that it wasn't from him? Like, did, is that something he said? I, I missed that. And, uh, you know, the, the, what, what my point is in getting that is, yes, every good and perfect gift comes from God. It, the Bible tells us that. However, it doesn't say that only good and perfect gifts come from God, does it? See what I mean? So can God be a judgmental God at the same time as a forgiving God? Yes. Yes. And uh, there, there's more that I could say about that, but I think that, that kind of summarizes it. So Job hadn't done anything wrong, and the real question here is God just. Was God justified in what he did with Job? Was, was he just? That he would allow punishment on people that uh, didn't have it coming. So just a basic understanding. We've talked about this in parts, but we're going to have to look way deeper into it. The first thing that I want to mention, everyone has done wrong. There is no such thing as a person on this world that has not sinned at all. Okay, That's just not a thing. The Bible doesn't say that Job never did anything wrong. It's just saying that he was righteous. That's pretty much what it means. It means that he you know, lived well. He was submitted to God. He was living morally. Not that he was perfect. So everyone has done wrong. No one is perfect. Job, bad things happen. So the question, the problem there, though, with this, and I think that this is actually essential to understand, is that still that doesn't answer the question because Job didn't deserve the bad things to happen to him. It, 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 that's kind of the point of Job. Like, why do righteous people suffer? People who didn't have it coming, right? Not, not to say that he'd never done anything wrong, but he was a righteous person. He was out there living his life and, and doing the doing the good. He wasn't out there partying. He wasn't out there, you know, just being a general nuisance or, you know, selling drugs to kids. I mean, he, he wasn't out there doing these things. He was he was a righteous, upstanding person. And yet, God still allowed these great tragedies to happen to him. I mean, I threw a fit about losing one of my children, and he lost all kinds of his kids. I mean, there's like seven kids of his that died. I mean, geez, let's calm down here. I, I threw a fit because I have two or three diseases. Job was afflicted with all these different bad things that happened to him, lost all his wealth, lost all these different things. I was like, okay, all right. Yeah, okay, I get it. So, you know, what's going on here? Another thing that's key to understanding this, but I don't think it necessarily applies to, well, no, it does apply to Job in part. And that's something that I believe um, Jesus said this one, that the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. So basically, God's blessings come to everyone. To everyone. And here's something that people never ask, because you never ask in times of good things. You only ask in times of pain. What did I do to deserve this pain? What did you do to deserve the blessing? And the answer? Nothing. Nothing. None of us has done anything to earn, earn blessing. And so what we do is, well, I'm a Christian. I've been a good Christian. I've read my Bible. I've gone to church. I did all the things right. I, I did a ministry and all these different things. These bad things shouldn't happen to me. Well, <laughs> see, that's, that's substituting faith for works. I deserve God to give me these good things now. Maybe when I was saved, I was when I, when I first got saved, I was a hooligan. But now, I've held the line, and I, I'm a good person now. I, I, I've earned my place now. Now it's up to God to keep all these blessings. And that's not really the way it works. Obviously, we never deserve the blessings. And just to be on here, we don't deserve salvation. We never will deserve salvation. So no matter how good you live for how long you live, it doesn't matter. You won't deserve it. So, uh, But the issue is unresolved because we're talking not just about Job's suffering. We're talking about God's justice, God's just character. <laughs> is he a just God? Does God? And so that we can ask, we can start to answer the question by asking another question. Does God owe fairness and a pain-free existence? Does God owe it to us? Because when we're going through pain, isn't that exactly what we do? God, this isn't fair. Well, who said that God owes us fairness? God, this shouldn't have happened. 
I shouldn't have lost my child. They were too young to die of cancer. They, I really enjoyed them here, and I prayed for their, for their, for their um, healing. They, they weren't healed. When did God say that he owed us fairness? Some of us are going to live really long. Some of us are going to die really young. That's just the way of things. Like, it, 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 it's not an equal across the board. And this is one of the biggest problems with, with, with um, equality between the genders, right? Because equal means sameness, and men and women will never be sane. They'll, they'll never be the same. They will always be different, no matter how you cut, how you dice it up. If a dude cuts off his wiener and takes hormones, he still won't be a girl. And he'll never understand what it's like to be a girl. He'll never have a child growing inside of him. He'll never have that other chromosome. Never. Ever. Even with hormones, he will never have that other, uh, other uh, chromosome. He will never know what it's like to have to go through the agony of a period every month. He'll never know these things. All he'll have is a, is a deformed genital. That's it, and an increase of a hormone that doesn't naturally, isn't naturally produced in his body. That's it. He will never know what it's like to be a woman. He will never have to have to carry the weight of how you know women are treated. And the same is true for women with men. Women will never know how hard it is to be a man. It is extremely hard to be a man. Men are required to do a lot more than women. We're, we're expected to be providers on all these different things. That's something that a woman, even taking pills, is not going to suddenly experience an encounter. That's your your brain works differently. Testosterone kind of fries the brain, and so men look at things and understand things differently than women. Even if a woman starts taking testosterone, it's not going to change how she understands the problem. Men and women are and are inherently different, not just in our genetics, but also in our societal standing, there, there's a lot of different things that make men and women, men and women different. And that's one of the things is, is, is it's not fair. Even among men, it's not fair. Let's take the world's most talented female athlete and pit her again, up against the world's most talented male athlete. Who's going to win? The male every single time. Every single time. Men's bodies are made to do that physical labor. Women's bodies are made to do the labor of childbirth. That's not to say that's the only thing that they can do. But do you notice how women's hips literally cave out to, to bear a child? Men don't do that. Men are made to carry big things. They're, me they're meant to protect. They're, that's what God made them to be like. It's not fair. It's how it is. Even among men, there's differences, right? So some men are going to be more emotional. Some men are going to be more uh, maybe unable to cry. There's actually men who, who cannot cry physically or unable to cry. It can cause serious problems too. <laughs> serious physical problems it can cause. Uh, but anyways, and uh, that's something that the women really don't have a problem with. <laughs> they can cry. <laughs> let, let them at it. They, can, they, can, they got it covered. Um, and that's not, that's not fair, but not all women are the same either. So when, when you compare to any two women, they're, one's going to do something better than the other one. Well, that's not fair. Life isn't fair. Like, nothing in life is, is, is fair. Why would it suddenly become fair when we're talking about God? Does God owe us fairness or a pain-free existence? No, he doesn't. So we can start looking at the answer. We have done nothing to ask to be created by God. Did you ask to be created before you were created? No, no. We have done nothing to ask to be created, but that doesn't make him indebted to us. Well, I didn't want to be created in the first place, so God owes me to, to get me out of this pickle. That's not how that's not how things work. Um, really, you can submit to God and realize that He created you and just accept that and walk in that, or you can be bitter towards God and say, "Well, I didn't ask to be created, anyways." I mean, it's it's up to you. But either way, it's not like His gun's gonna be like, "Well, okay, you made a good valid argument. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to your birth and pretend like it didn't happen." So just because you didn't ask to be created doesn't mean that God is indebted to you. Rather, it makes us indebted to him because he made us. Even if we don't want to be here, we are still indebted to him. It's not up to us. This is one of the biggest things that talked me out of suicide, is realizing that the day of my death is not up to me. I'll die whenever I die. So this whole nonsense of, oh, I should never have been born, all these different things, it's not up to me. I am here, and whenever I go, that's up to God. We have done nothing to make God in our debt. Nor can we. So God doesn't owe us anything. There's never going to be a time when you have the one up on God and so you can finally say, now God owes me. On a side note, though, um, 
I do want to say that we do make too much of our affliction and too little of God. There's been numerous times in in my different various sufferings when I've noticed that I've made it a thing all about me. And oftentimes, um, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we do this for sympathy, and sometimes we do it for uh, because we're hurt in our hearts. Sometimes, well, we have lots of different reasons, but the worst that happens to us could be worse. It could always be worse. And in life, you will either be focused on making much of God or making much of your problem. And I know that not everybody here is, has physical problems, so I'll try and make it more relatable to you guys. When bad things happen, you can either focus on the bad things that happen or you can focus on the big God. And that's just the way it is. You can make yourself the victim or you can make yourself in awe of the one who blesses you beyond compare. It's, it's what all of us have to do. We, we can pick one or the other, but I can guarantee you if you make God big, your problems won't seem so big. If you make the problem big, God will not seem big enough. It'll always be, You always need more. More attention, more sympathy, more days off because it's just, it gets too tiring. Carrying the weight of, of, of problems without God is just, it's draining. It's very much so draining. So is God justified in an unprovoked punishment? How dare he? Well, like I said, this question is a lot harder to answer but part of part of the part of the solution i think comes in what chuck said in his series i believe it was last month's series i think it was the second week of last last month if you want to go back it was called um dealing with death or something like that and one thing that he pointed out is that everybody's going to die we see it as god being immoral if he allows a mass killing right so there's something that happens a bomb explodes or or an earthquake happens, or a flood or something, and God has done something immoral in allowing something bad to happen. How dare he? But the truth is that everyone is going to die. When How many people die at one single time is completely irrelevant. Okay, Let's pretend that, the, that people have exp expanded exponentially. We're across a bunch of planets, thousands of planets. Well, in order to sustain such a large population, people would be dying at massive amounts in every second. So take those massive amounts of natural deaths, and they would equal more so than an atomic bomb going off nowadays in a city. So does that make that death more immoral of God than the death of a bomb? So, I mean, if you actually think about it, it's all relative. Everybody dies. Everybody's going to die. So if a bunch of people die at one time, that doesn't make God immoral. If he decided to cut somebody's life short, it's not that big of a deal. Remember, 80 years is not that long anyways. It's... Our time here on Earth is very limited anyway. It's not that big of a deal. Like, this is just... Have you ever read a really long book that had, like, this super super short prologue? Like, a page-long prologue, and then the book is, like, 800 pages long? That's kind of how it is with God. I mean, this time on Earth is just very short, and we have a lot ahead of us. So God isn't subject to us. He is the potter. He doesn't have to answer for things. He doesn't have to do what we like. He gets to decide what to do with his creation. When you create a, a person, you can decide what to do with that person. But remember that God is good, and everything that he does is good, even if I don't like it and even if it's painful. Whereas you are not good. You do good things, but you are not inherently good like God is. So you would obviously eventually do something bad. This is why people, oh, I'll never do that with my kids. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You will not be the perfect parent. I hate to rip off that band-aid, but you won't be. There's no such thing as a perfect parent of, if we're talking about people. Uh, we live in a fallen world, and we suffer accordingly. Bad things happen. And another way of saying that is there will be troubles in this life. So whether we cause it directly or not, we will suffer. Some things are caused by God. Some things are caused by us. Some things are caused by others doing stupid things. Uh, for instance, you're driving with somebody, right? And they're a terrible driver, and they jerk on the wheel, and they flip the car, and you die. Whose fault was that? Well, it was their fault. You shouldn't have to suffer, but you still do. When you go to pastor at a church where another person has been the pastor, you have to clean up messes that you didn't create. Is that fair? No. <laughs> Lots of things in life are not fair. Get over the idea of fair. And then some things are just naturally going to happen. It's not necessarily God you know, intervening in the situation. It's just something that's naturally going to happen. You will die. Natural occurrence. <laughs> you do not have to worry about, did God specifically desire that I died at this exact moment? Don't worry about it. God has limited your days, and you fulfilled the number of your days. That, that's, that's it. That, that's it. 
Without troubles, though, we do not grow. That is a fact of life. If you do not experience troubles, you will not grow. However, here's the, here's the flip. Here's the paradox, okay? Sometimes even with troubles, we don't grow. Sometimes we think that, the, that we're growing, and then trouble comes by, and it just we, we, we just stop. We just stop. We don't want to get involved with God anymore. We don't want to get involved in the church or service or, or anything. We're just like, no. And it just gets worse and worse and worse, and it makes us more and more bitter. And we start getting mad at people around us. Why weren't they there for us? Why? How come I'm always there for everybody else, and they aren't here for me? And how come? And we just like get upset about why God? Why did you even allow this to happen? Ah, this isn't fair that this is happening to me. All these different things. And we can become trouble. And we, I'm sorry, we can become we can become where we don't grow. But the thing is, without troubles, babies aren't born. We we'll talk about the trouble involved there. Uh, money isn't earned because you don't. Face trouble. You're not going to earn money unless you go to work and deal with problems. Uh, diseases aren't treated. How many diseases have you ever had treated that the pain, the the the, the, um, the treatment was completely painless? That's eh, fine. You've never had a reaction to medicine. You've never had. Okay, but it treats the illness, right? Without troubles, there isn't progress. So you have a disease. The illness brings something bad, but it brings something good too. Um, muscles don't get bigger in exercise without trouble, right? You don't, you can't just be like, be there all like, I will not exercise. Are my muscles bigger? No, there has to be some kind of trouble. Weightlifting, training, eating healthier. There's a process that happens and your body slowly starts changing and getting better. God works in pain to open our eyes and to draw us closer if we allow it to. And there's because we don't always allow it to. In life, generally speaking, we gravitate to ourself. We gravitate to whatever feels good. But in life, pain always wakes wakens us up. It wakes us up, okay? Pain reminds us of our mortality and our true home. If it wasn't for pain, we would go through our life living for ourselves totally fine. Eh, who cares? Totally fine. You know, but pain does something. It reminds us, like, oh, that's right, I am mortal. That when when you have that moment of realization, when you're born, you see everything as as continuous, right? Your parents have always existed, always. They've always been there. They always will be. As you get older, you have to start to have a little bit of a crisis. They're gonna die one day. Holy crap, they're gonna die one day. I'm not gonna have them one day. And you have like this total meltdown. You're like, oh my god, this isn't supposed to happen. This isn't this isn't right. And uh, so you have this, this, this kind of wake-up call. And what does that wake-up call do? It, it, you, it, it introduced pain, yeah, but what did that pain do? Pain brought change, a change, change of awareness. If you didn't enjoy your life, I'm sorry, if, if, you didn't, if you weren't aware of this, you wouldn't enjoy your life for what it truly is. See, death doesn't make life terrifying. Death makes it more important that every day is a gift. You wake up and you realize, hey, another day. That's a good thing. But the problem is, is that oftentimes, especially for those of us who are in daily pain, we get this idea that, oh, I just don't have the strength to get up today. And it's easy to slip into. If you've ever been there, it's really easy. But you have to start changing the narrative in your own head and saying, no, 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 no. I don't want to have that attitude. This is another day. It's a gift. I can do this. Let's just, let's just go. So pain reminds us of our mortality, reminds us of our true home, that we don't belong here, that, hey, yeah, things might be bad here, but guess what? We're not staying here for forever. Pain inflicted by others shows us the hurt that sin causes and shows us what, that what we do matter. When somebody hurts us, it, it shows us, oh, I need to watch what I'm doing to people because it makes them feel bad. But if we never experienced that, we wouldn't, we'd just go through life whatever. I'm just going to go, go through life and just sleep around with all the, all the girls. If she's pretty, I'll sleep with her. And I'll say mean things to the ones that I don't think are pretty enough. Eh, you're an ugly. You're a dog. You know, these different things. And hurting those different people. And then what happens when you actually experience it in yourself? You're like, oh, well, that doesn't feel good. So it, it shows us how, how treating others affects them. And, um, and it shows us that sin really does hurt. Another thing pain does is it awakens us to a realization in each of us for our eternal home to seek after it, to seek after being with God, and helps us to live wisely. There's a, there's a desire in each of us to be with God, and you know we don't realize it because, oh man, I just wish I could go somewhere where I just get away from all this nonsense. Yeah, you can. It's called heaven. It shows us why God has to bring punishment. 
If we didn't experience pain, we'd never understand why God has to bring punishment. So when God's trying to work character in us and he's trying to work through different things, what oftentimes happens is we get bitter and self-absorbed. Oh, poor me that this happened to me. Everybody feel bad for me. And we don't grow from it because we're too busy feeling sorry for ourselves, making ourselves victims. Our ultimate goal in life is to grow. It's not to be comfortable. Never forget that. Well, this is an uncomfortable situation. Yep, you are right. And the goal is not to be comfortable. If the goal was to be comfortable, nobody would ever become a pastor because being a pastor is extremely uncomfortable. If the goal of, of life was to be comfortable, we would never witness because that's very uncomfortable. Going and talking to somebody about God, oh my gosh, it's way easier to just, you do you and I'm going to do, do me. The, the, the modern mindset has just completely wrecked the church because we're having new Christians grow up that aren't sharing their faith and it's a complete 180 from the past generation who they share their faith in a very obnoxious way. Now we've gone to the other place and, oh, everything's relative, you know, whatever works for you. So I'm just going to not share my faith. And it's going to be fine because I want it to be that way anyways. So we're all good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it doesn't really fix the problem. Um, God gets us there through troubles. Our ultimate goal is to grow and God gets us there through troubles. It ultimately, though... The thing about the about it was God justified. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if God was justified because it's not our concern. See, there's a lot of times in life when we try and put our finger where it doesn't belong. And one of the areas that we do this is trying to tell God what is fair and what isn't fair. God, you shouldn't have allowed this to happen. It's like, well, I don't think he asked. Right? Think about all the different bad things you've gone through in life. And stop and say, has God ever asked me what my feelings were about going through that? No, he kind of just threw me in. Right? So it, it's something that's not really in our, in, our, in, our, in our business. Ain't no business. However, the point of tonight is not to look at, well, we shouldn't ask the question. But we did ask the question. So here we are. So we will still discover. It was God justified. Well, if God can prevent bad things, does he have to be does he have to in order to be good? Sorry, I said that wrong. If God can prevent bad things, does he have to prevent bad things in order to be good? Well, there's that's kind of a weighted question. First off, what is good? Is good simply something that I enjoy? See, I mean like sex is good. Does that mean you see what I mean like it feels good? Does that mean I can just go have sex with whoever? I mean it's good, right? See, a lot of times we, we, oh, well, God didn't stop the bad thing. What bad thing are we talking about here? See, the first thing that needs to be asked before you can even answer the question of was God justified in, in, in not stopping the bad thing was what is bad? Is it, are we simply talking about something that's painful? Well, he should have saved my grandma. Your grandma was going to die anyways. If he healed her today, she would have died tomorrow anyways. You don't know how many people I, I talk to. They're, well, I prayed for him to, to heal this person and they died anyways. Okay, you weren't holding her ransom. God was taking her home or sending her to punishment, depending. And, you know, you asked and he denied your request. Does that make sense? Like, it's not something that, that is up to us. Just because we pray doesn't mean God owes us something. So if we're talking about a death, that's not God doing something bad. If we're talking about God sending the people to hell, that's not God doing something bad either. He gives to all according to, to, to their works, according to, to where they're at. If you found, founded your life on believing God, you don't have to worry about it. It's not your problem, right? But if you didn't, and you lived your life for yourself, then you are reaping what you planted. That's not God doing something bad. That's us refusing to walk away from our badness. Well, this person was a good person. They just didn't believe in Jesus. So what does that mean that they were a good person? Nobody's a good person. If they didn't believe in Jesus, they weren't forgiven. It's that simple. There's a free gift. You take it and you live. That's simple. Like it... Well, I don't think that's right. He didn't ask. <laughs> it's not a democracy. We're not voting on this. God, all good and all powerful, said, hey, by the way, you deserve punishment because y'all are wicked. However, uh, here's a free option. Completely free. I already paid the whole bill. Well, that's not good enough for me. I don't even think, I think it's stupid. You know, but I don't know. Well, that's your fault. Like, there has to be some, some wisdom here. So it, the first thing that has to be asked is what is bad? The second, though, it's, it's not always in our best interest, though, to, for God to prevent bad things from happening. It's not. If God prevented bad things from happening, we would be coddled and spoiled and we'd never grow and mature. If your life was all about you, guess who you'd spend your whole life pleasing? Yourself. 
Pain, though, allows us to connect with others. See what I mean? When you go through daily pain, you look at other people who are going through daily pain, you're like, how can I help? How can we help each other? How can we connect? And you connect with people that you wouldn't have connected with otherwise. Um, so we often do not mean immoral when we say bad. And there, that's a very serious question that why we have to ask, well, what is bad? God is not immoral, but he does cause bad things to happen sometimes. Yeah. And I already said the thing about the good gift. God punishing the guilty, Christians correcting one another in wisdom and without rebelling against authority, babying our kids, sheltering the headstrong from the real world. These are all examples of times when you shouldn't prevent a bad thing. And I'll go through them one by one again. God punishing the guilty. Yeah, punishment is a, is a bad thing. Nobody wants to be punished. However, without punishment, there is no morality. Second off, I said Christians correcting one another. This is something that, that a lot of Christians don't like, especially modern Christians, but Christians are, are meant to be accountable to one another. So there has to be that. But I will say this, that with Christians correcting each other, it should be done wisely. Not, not stupidly. And for saying it off, it should be without rebelling against authority. There's a lot of people who go against their authority. And, oh, well, you did, 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 do. And it's like, okay, God doesn't create us to be spoiled usurpers. Um, the next thing, uh, babying your kids. What happens if you baby your kids? Grace, you want to fill in the fill in the blanks on this one? What happens if you if you if you do nothing but baby your kids? Okay. Can you give any any examples or anything? No, kids are never breaks. So they'll just go in here and take them randomly and throw the glass cup on the ground and break it. But if you baby them and be like, oh, honey, it's okay. I know you took it. Well, you're going to end up having something in your stomach after about a month because they're going to think all the good things you did. It's true. Versus if they learn that there's consequences for breaking the good kids, you know, because you were disciplined or Another thing is it prepares them for the real world. Sheltering the headstrong from the real world, which leads me to my last final, final little thing. Okay, so somebody goes and, let's say hypothetically, rapes a girl who is not conscious. And so then, at the at the hearing, the judge says, "Well, I don't want to, I don't want to affect his, the boy's future, so we're not going to charge him with anything." And he goes off scot free, and the girl has to go the rest of her life having to carry the weight of being raped and having not faced any justice. Oh, uh, that actually did happen uh, a couple years ago. And uh, what, what happened? Well, a headstrong boy was sheltered from the real world. And because that judge tried to cut him a break, he robbed that boy of ever becoming a man. Men face up to the responsibility and to the, to the consequences of their actions. Boys don't. That judge robbed that boy of ever becoming a man. He's going to spend the rest of his life having these little girls that he just sleeps around with and doesn't see any of the consequences. And one day, he's going to see consequences. They're going to smack him in the face. And he's going to be completely unprepared for how to deal with it. And those are the kinds of people who commit suicide because they're faced with reality and it's just they can't deal with it. They don't know how to deal with it. And what about that girl? What about that girl? Nobody was even thinking about her in the process. And yes, I understand, and I, and I agree. You shouldn't put yourself in compromising positions. Yes, I understand. You, you shouldn't go out into parties like that if you want to drink, stay at home to do it. Yes, I, I agree. You, you should make sure to wear things where, you know, guys, you know, to keep yourself safe. Because guys, there's a lot of pigs out there. However, she still has to build and, bear and carry that weight for the rest of her life. Sheltering headstrong people from the real world. Oh, what you wouldn't want anything, any bad thing to happen to him. Well, no, 
not necessarily about revenge here. We're not talking about revenge. We're talking about he did something bad to somebody else. And by withholding the punishment to him, you cause a bigger problem. So, if it is in your power to always do good and to stop every bad consequence from happening, should you? No. No, you should not. And so God, allowing bad things to happen doesn't make him immoral. Another thing is that God disciplines us. But when, when we say God disciplines us, that conjures something up here that's not exactly what the Bible has in mind. We think of something like a spanking, right, or punishment. Discipline is always about punishment with us. With God, that's not always the case. The Bible says that God disciplines those who he loves. So what is discipline? Well, yeah, discipline can be punishment, but it's also a process of growth and training and learning. And so God refines our character. He grows us in here by disciplining us. How does he discipline us? By allowing things that we don't like to happen. That's how he disciplines us. When you go and serve people and they hate you for it anyways, and you still do the right thing. That's God disciplining you, you grow in. When something bad happens to you, you, you get sick, or something bad happens, you lose a job, or God's disciplining you to refine your character. Think about this. You're a spoiled brat who's never been out of, out of his mommy and daddy's house. You go out and get a job, and because of your crappy little attitude, your boss fires you. An opportunity for God to discipline you and for you to grow your character and to learn how to treat people, and you won't get fired at the next job. Wouldn't have happened without discipline. So yes, God allowed something bad to happen for your well-being. So is God justified in punishing Job when he did nothing wrong? <laughs> God is not responsible for how others respond. And that's the big key concept I want you to get. Did God punish Job? No. Did God allow discipline to come on Job? Yes. There's a big difference there. And the next thing I want to say, whether you say that God caused or allowed the punishment on Job, here's the thing. God is not responsible for how others respond. God brought up Job. That's, that's not God's fault that Satan challenged that. He didn't make Job. Uh, he didn't make Satan punish him. I mean, uh, 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 um, try to contradict God. He didn't make Satan do that. Satan chose to. God might have understood what he was going to do, that doesn't mean that Satan's actions were not his own. God is not responsible for how others respond to him. So, is God justified in punishing Job? He didn't punish him. He allowed something bad to happen to him. Was he justified in allowing something bad to happen to somebody? Bad things happen to everybody. Well, yeah, but specifically someone that's righteous. And it wouldn't have happened if, you know, Satan, if Job, God wouldn't have brought up Job to Satan. Well, God is not responsible for how others respond. God did bring up, uh, so what, God has to walk on eggshells because of how somebody might respond? That's not God's character. That's not God's character. So, Satan may have been tempted to attack Job, but God didn't force him to. He didn't force Adam and Eve to sin in the garden either. He gave them a chance, just like he gave Satan the chance. So God refines everyone, regardless of what they deserve. Right now, whatever you're going through in life, God is trying to refine them. Fact. Sometimes he'll do it through good times. Sometimes he'll do it through bad times. If you're in a good time, don't worry. Bad times are coming. If you're in a bad time, don't worry. Good times are coming. It's all right. But through the process, God is refining you. You can either submit to that and use it as an opportunity and encouragement to grow and mature in Christ. Or you can use it as an opportunity to save yourself. Since, if I'm being completely honest, since January, when all this crap happened, my spiritual life with God has suffered because I did not use it to grow. I used it to feel sorry for myself. See how that works? You have a problem that comes up in your life. You all will have it. If you, I mean, you already have some. You'll have it. You know, the Marines, that's, that's a good first step, but trust me, you're going to have problems that come by. When that happens, you will have an opportunity to grow or you'll have an opportunity to shrink. Either way, God's not going to shelter you from it. It's going to happen. It doesn't matter what you deserve in life. God refines everyone. I didn't do anything to deserve this bad thing. Okay, irrelevant. It's going to happen anyways. God can do as he pleases with his creation. Can you do as you wish with your things? When you have something, can you do whatever you want with it? Yeah, God can the same. And you might say, well, hold on. Uh, uh, but we're conscious, you know, so God, you know, we're, we're, a, we're not just a plaything. I didn't say that God said that we were a plaything, but 
let's follow that thought. Just because we are conscious, we are, we are aware, and don't like what God does, that doesn't mean we are right in opposing him. God, you shouldn't have done that. Nor does it mean that we can will ourselves out of his oversight. Well, I don't like how God's doing this. So I'm just going to, because I don't like it, God's not going to be in charge anymore. That's not going to happen. We do what we think is best and argue with God from our limited knowledge. But God fully understands, not just the situation, he understands us, he understands the implications, he understands the outcome. He completely, fully understands, and he does what is best. Even if it's at our temporary dissatisfaction. Okay, God is not concerned with us being happy and content every minute of, this, of every day. We choose to be content, and we have a home where we will be eternally satisfied. And that's how things work in the kingdom. How many times have you tried to do what's right and it blows up in your face even when you, when, when you, uh, when you do the best you could? Think about that. When you try to do the best when, when you do the best you could and, and you try your very hardest and it still blows up in your face. Well, God is always doing things that are right. And guess what? Some people aren't happy with how he did things happens however god doesn't coddle us he doesn't protect us from the big bad world and we have to rest in the knowledge that our suffering is temporary and limited he sees the end game and he loves us even if he allows things that we don't like love doesn't mean that only what we like will happen that's not what it means that's, that's not what love is in the grand scheme of things, the things we freak out over, and I really want you to understand this, the things we really freak out over in life, they aren't as big of a deal as we think. Job's children were already going to die. He just outlived them. And that's a painful burden to carry. But remember that after you die, your kids are going to die anyways. See what I mean? We mourn because the loss of opportunity... And we mourn because it reminds us of our death. And we mourn because it, we feel sad about the idea of them not getting a life. We mourn because it doesn't seem right. We, we oftentimes can't even tell why we're mourning. We just know that we are mourning. And that's the way things work. But either way, the issue is not in God's goodness, in God's morality. The issue is more in our understanding and this is one of the reasons why it's very important that we continue to grow and to mature more and more. Any questions? No? We're good? Okay, next week we'll look at toxic femininity. It's not going to be a sexist rant, I swear to God. If you think that that's what it's going to be, don't even bother. It's not what it's at, at at all. We're not going to sit around talking about how stupid women are. We're not going to talk about how stupid feminism is. We're not going to sit around talking about how stupid toxic masculinity is. We're not going to talk about any of those things, okay? We're just going to try and look at it more biblically and understand it more biblically and try and grow from the from the arguments that our culture is having around us. That's it. Okay? Everybody good with that? Okay, we'll stop there.